now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. One would not expect a show this spooky to come from Oklahoma City, but it did. The NBC show Dark Fantasy. This episode, entitled The Demon Tree, was originally broadcast December 5th, 1941. Three pounds on the Jack of Diamonds. You should tear your money up, Humphreys. It would last you longer. (laughs) Perhaps you're right, Crane. But this way I get a sense of honest toil. I say, isn't anyone else betting? Oh, let's quit. I'm tired of losing. Oh, look here, old girl. Could I loan you a few pounds? No, thank you, Crane. (laughs) I've enough to get me back to London. If we ever do get back. Now, why do you say that, Clara? It's only a matter of a stage getting through here to the resort and taking us out of this beastly place. Beastly place is right. Why people come here for a rest is more than I can determine. Honestly. I've never spent such an uncomfortable week in all my life. Well, think of me. I've been here three. So have you, Humphreys. Mm. Oh, look here, you two. It's three o'clock. They're expecting the stage around eight tonight. Uh, what do you say the three of us go for a bit of a walk through the forest? I say, why not? Oh, here comes Danvers. Perhaps he'll join us. Anything to get away from this place. Uh, good afternoon, Danvers. Uh, greetings, good people. I take it you're no happier than when I left you a while ago. Oh, the place is as gloomy as a morgue. We've just agreed to take a walk in the forest back of the inn. You're invited to come along if you like. Sounds like a good enough way to pass the time. Oh, good. And we all go together. Besides... I'm quite interested in that forest out there. You remember, of course, the story the night clerk told us last evening. Yes, I don't like him. He talks through his nose. People should talk through their mouths. No, no, no. I mean, what he told us about the forest. What about the forest? I didn't hear it, Humphreys. Well, the clerk said it was a gorgeous place. Lots of beautiful foliage, vivid colors, clear water lakes. But nobody goes there so beautiful. That's just it, Clara. You see, people have gone there and never come back. Rubbish. A lot of nonsense. Why, the clerk is just superstitious, that's all. I am inclined to agree with you, Danvers. Why, he even told us an absurd story about about a tree out there in that forest that's supposed to strangle people. (laughs) Strangle them? How? Oh, I don't know. With its branches, I suppose. Just some absurd legend the people around here like to believe. I believe it's more than just a legend, Crane. Eh? And what makes you say that, old man? Uh, here. I talked to the clerk again later last night. He dug out this old newspaper clipping for me. Read it, Danvers. Alarm. Mm-hmm. Old is right. Almost illegible. Well, read it. It says... London, England, April 21st, 1857. It is reported that Sir Horace Wakefield, Earl of Dorsha, was found strangled last night in Barlow Forest. His body was discovered entangled in the branches of a huge oak tree. Oh. Oh, Go on, read the rest of it. Earl's death recalls to mind the weird tale of the witch of Barlow Forest, who is said to have lived in the 16th century. An evil old hag who, upon having a falling out with Sir Thomas Holly Wakefield, cursed him and warned him that any of his descendants who entered Barlow Forest would surely perish. Mm, Charming old girl, wasn't she? No, no, no. Don't scoff until you've heard the rest of it. Go on, Danvers. She also added that any person or persons 
with the Wakefield descendant, would also die. She is said to have planted an acorn smeared with her own blood. The acorn is supposed to have grown into a towering oak capable of moving about from place to place in Barlow Forest. Sir Horace is the sixth of the Wakefield line to have perished by strangulation in the forest. Thomas Hurley Wakefield. I wonder. Hmm? You wonder what, Gray? Uh, my mother's name was Wakefield. I was just wondering if she was related to Sir Thomas. Oh, of course not, Crane. It's just a story. But uh, an extraordinary story, wouldn't you say? Well, yes. Wouldn't do very well as a bedtime story, would it? A demon tree. I wonder if we could find it. <laughs> well, let's have a try, shall we? I'm gay. Don't let anybody say I'm not. Then let's go. Oh, Humphrey's going along. I say, Humphrey's, are you daydreaming? Hmm? I was just thinking. Wouldn't it be odd if the whole thing were true? If we all went in there and didn't come back. Gentlemen, see any way we can get into that forest? It's as dense as Father Time's beard. Doesn't seem to be an opening anywhere. I think we can get in over here. Oh, all right. Coming, Danvers. There seems to be a footpath over here. Only one along this line of the forest. There, seems. Oh, yes, you're right. Uh, come on, I'll leave. Uh, we'd better remember the way back. It would be hard to get out of here if we didn't know where this opening is. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll remember it. I'm good at landmarks. Go ahead, Clara. I'm right behind you. I say... Do any of you feel that? Feel what, Danvers? A chill. I feel like... Like it's 20 degrees colder in this place. I feel that way, too. So do I. It's naturally cooler in the woods where the sun doesn't shine. But not this much cooler. I don't like this place. I'm for going back to the inn. Oh, let's get on ahead a little ways. I say it. It is pretty in here. Pretty or not, it gives me the creeps. It isn't the kind of cold caused by climatic changes. What was that, Denver? I said it's a different kind of cold. It's the kind that creeps up your spine when some... some evil comes over you. Oh, now, Danvers. We're just letting that newspaper story play on your mind. Wait a minute, eh? Look! That tree there in front of us it looks like a human giant. Jove. You're right, Danvers. I could swear it moved just a moment ago. It did move. I saw it too. That's the strangest looking tree I ever saw. Look at that bark. I wonder if... Crane! What's wrong, man? I... I just touched bark of that tree and it it didn't feel like bark at all. What? No. It felt like like human skin. Yeah. Let me feel it. By heaven. It's true. It does feel like skin. Warm and smooth and soft. Yes. Feels that way to me, too. Humphreys, you touch it. No, thanks. Go ahead, Humphreys. Feel it. I have no desire to. You see, I'm sure you're right. What's that? I feel that... that this is the demon tree of Barlow Forest. Humphreys. I think we've seen enough of this place, haven't we? Let's get back to the end. Yes, let's. All right. Come on. I say, wait a minute. Have you noticed how dark it is? All of a sudden. The sun's behind a cloud, probably. It's impossible to see the sky through this foliage. It is darker. 
I can hardly see where I'm walking. Are you quite sure this is the right way? I don't remember this clearing. I don't either. Wait a minute. By heaven, this isn't the way. But it must be. We're on the path, aren't we? No. No, I don't think we are. It's so dark. Do any of you have a flash? I certainly don't remember this clearing. I think... <gasps> what was that? What was what, Crane? Uh, you... You'll think this is foolish, but... I swear I felt the branch of a tree brush across my face and shoulder. That's... That's impossible. There's not a tree within 50 feet of us. But I felt it, I tell you. It rustled like a branch covered with leaves and dear, yet it it felt warm and soft like human flesh Crane are you sure? yes look we're lost here it's dark dark as night right in the middle of the afternoon and we've lost the path in that tree easy Crane I'll keep your head man I'm getting out of here I'm not going to stay here and be murdered Crane Stay with us. No, no. I'm going to find the path and get out of here. Crane, stay here. We'll find a way back. I don't want to stay here and die. I want to get away from this place. Crane, don't be a fool. Crane! December 5th, 1941. Dark Fantasy here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Dark Fantasy was an extremely spooky late Friday night program on NBC. Uh, The stories written by Scott Bishop did a pretty good job, and I think you'll uh, enjoy them as we can find them. Of the 31 episodes that aired, at least 28 recordings have survived. From December 5th, 1941, Dark Fantasy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. He's gone. Now he is in for it. We're better off by staying together. I don't know whether we are or not. Listen! It's great. Sounds like he's strangling. Come on! Oh, he couldn't have gotten far. Right over here, I think. Take it easy now. Be careful. (gasps) Oh, there he is. Yes. Stretched out on the ground. Like... Like he was... Dead. <laughs> Look. Look at him. Oh. Marks on his throat. Like hands would make. That wasn't done by hands. See? Stains on his skin. Green stains. Thomas Wakefield Crane. Oh, what a horrible way for him to die. Clara, that tree. This is where we first saw it. Now it's gone. Humphrey, you're right. This is where it was. I'm sure of it. Then what's happened to it? The important question is, what are we going to do with Crane? We'll have to leave him here until we can find a way out of this place. Poor Crane. It, It happened so quickly. One minute he was with us and the next... We warned him not to leave us. Now the three of us had better stay close together. Oh, yes, for heaven's sake, let's not get separate. And do come on. There's nothing we can do for Crane now. We've got to find our way out of here. It doesn't seem right, leaving him there. It's all we can do. Come on. How do we know which way to go? We don't. All we can do is keep moving and hope to find the path again. Oh, it's horrible. Wandering about like this, like... Like nothing but a group of marionettes. Controlled by what strange puppeteer? What? What's that, Humphreys? I said... Controlled by what strange puppeteer? Humphreys, surely you don't think we've been purposely led into this? Who can say? Oh, now, Humphreys... Crane went off the deep end. We've got to keep our heads. We found a way in. Surely we'll find a way out. Yes. Yes, we did find a way in. But 
What about the chill? The darkness? There's some explanation. Perhaps a storm is coming up. Yes. That could be it. Couldn't it? Storms don't rise that quickly in this part of the country. And the darkness. It came down on this forest like a shroud. Yes. It came so quickly. Hmm. Reminded me of how a corpse must feel in his coffin when the lid is put over it. Look here, Humphreys. I'm about fed up with that sort of talk. Only a fool refuses to face the facts, Danvers. You know this isn't any ordinary situation we're in. The chill of winter and the summertime. Darkness in mid-afternoon. And a tree that strangles. This is probably just an... An accident. Crane's death. Why don't you stop trying to tell yourself that the tree was only an imaginary thing? We all know that it's real. Humphreys. And as alive as any of us. The bark did feel like human flesh. Danvers. Humphreys. Look. What? What is it? A glow of light there ahead of us. It's the tree. There. Now, what do you think, Danvers? Look. It's the tree moving along in a glow of phosphorescent light. Good heavens. It's the same tree. It looks like a human giant. It was nowhere near here. It was back there. Do you two see what the tree is carrying? It's carrying Crane. It's got him tucked up under that huge branch that looks like a human arm. It's fading now. Disappearing again. Fading away. Yes. Gone. He's gone. Now do you believe, Danvers? Now do you admit that the tree is alive? What else can I believe? I don't know. Danvers, look out! He's fallen into a water pit. Oh. Help! Help me! It's quick, down. What is thinking? Uh, help! I'm into my race! Get me out of here! Stand still, Danvers. You just sink deeper. Quick, help me out of here. Get something I can get out of. Here, Danvers. Danvers, grab the end of that pole. He'll let me help him. Grab it, Danvers. Grab it. The I... pole, Danvers. Grab the I end of it. you are. I can That tree branch. It's begging me. Good Lord. Listen, Clara. A tree branch. But we can't see it. I can't get near the pole. The branch keeps spinning me back. Humphrey, do something. He's up to his shoulders now. I can't. I can't make it. I can't help. Take me. Take me. No, I... You go under the quicksand and strangle. Danvers, there's nothing I can do. That tree. The demon tree. There's no saving from it. Uh, uh. Gone. Poor devil. Didn't have a chance. Humphreys, we've got to get out of here. We're all doomed. It's the Wakefield curse. Clara, stop it. It is the curse. We're helpless. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Clara, stop it. Humphreys. Now, we can't give up. We've got to find a way out of this place. Follow me. Be careful where you step. Whatever happens, keep your head, Clara, for heaven's sake. getting a little lighter. Clara, up ahead there. Isn't that a path? What? Oh, you're right, Humphreys. It's the path we came in on. And look, there's an opening through the trees. Yes, I remember the landmarks. Oh, thank God for the light. Come on, Clara, out of this place. There's nothing we can do for Danvers 
or claim now. December 5th, 1941, Dark Fantasy. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Dark Fantasy and the Demon Tree. December 5th, 1941. Clara. Yes? I I wonder if you feel as I do. I thought we'd be safe back here in the hotel. I don't know how to describe it, but I have a feeling that this whole business isn't over yet. I know. I've had the same feeling. A feeling that we're not finished with the demon tree. Or that it's not finished with us. Yes, exactly. Yeah, my room. I'd better go in and have a drink, Clara. Heaven knows we need one. Yes, I certainly do. What's worrying me is how we're going to explain what happened to Craig and Danvers. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll get the light. There. <gasps> Humphrey, on the bed there. Good Lord. The branch of a tree about two feet long. Humphrey, don't touch it. Look at it. Look at it. A fresh living branch. Put it down. Oh, Humphreys, I'm getting out of here. Where are you going? Down to the lobby and wait for the stage. Oh, hold on, I'll go with you. Wait, Clara. Wait, it's three flights down. Let's take the elevator. All right. We can get the thing up here. It's automatic. Just push the button, it'll come up. Humphreys, look. Someone left the steel gate open. I say, that's dangerous. It certainly is. <gasps> Humphreys, that branch is pushing me. Drop it! Drop it! Ah! Good Lord. Clara. Clara. That branch. It pushed her down the shaft. It's after me. Get away. Get away. Help me. Help me, somebody. The tree. The demon tree. It's talking me. Any descendant of Sir Thomas Hurley Wakefield who enters Barlow Forest is doomed to die. And all who enter the forest with him are likewise doomed. just heard The Demon Tree, an original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Tonight's cast included Eleanor Naylor Corrin as Clara, Ben Morris, who was Humphreys, Garland Moss took the part of Danvers, and Murillo Schofield was heard as Crane. Next Friday night at this time, the National Broadcasting Company will bring you another unusual and fantastic adventure thriller, Men Call Me Mad. The story of another world and the people who inhabit it. An exciting and weird tale of dark fantasy created by Scott Bishop. Dark fantasy originates in the studios of station WKY, Oklahoma City. December 5th, 1941, Dark Fantasy on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. 
Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're going to have a very sad story from yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This five-part story, the Cronin Matter, uh, that deals with a very old lady who has not really lived life and how people have taken advantage of her and how at the very end she doesn't get what she really wanted in life. But we'll see. Part one of the five-part years truly Johnny Dollar Show, The Cronin Matter, December 5th, 1955. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny. Shorty Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember her? Sure. The champagne dream girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the roaring 20s. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought it the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. May go on for a week. The last fling. And she's going to wear the Circle of Fire. Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up. Crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny, we've got a problem. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item 1, $14.80, transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment... As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. It looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Sylvia, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as as soon as... Oh, uh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar. Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes, if uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure. Go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar. Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With so... Oh, I see what you mean, you young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, why, Miss Blake? Just wondered. Well, he's looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No? How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Uh, She came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace, The Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake, oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh? Uh, Why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dollar? Fine, I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. 
He's afraid you might invite people like me. What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um, in a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Not that you're like that, of course. But it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Darla, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the Circle of Fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests. A thousand of them invited. And we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful. Back then. True, but... And then afterward... At four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle. And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you. And I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Crowley. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks. Our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Crowley. And the people I've invited. Hundreds, literally. People I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but... You know, it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, Sylvia, I didn't hear you come in. I'm the sneaky type. You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, you'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Short on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. She probably worked in a show with him back in those dear dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel Why thief. do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake... You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject. Obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's that? Hold it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I, I, I wasn't going to. Honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You, you got me all wrong. I wasn't okay, going to do that. Okay, relax. I was uh, just 38, coming... 38, stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. It belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin... She's an old friend of mine. 
I tried to get her to marry me once, over 30 years ago. A lot and can I... happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? No. Yeah. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not especially not to her. Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you met her. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Did my ears be burning? Or is it some other babe, you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend. A certain state prison warden. Oh, uh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you weren't over big. <laughs> well, you know... You are too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin. Hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment. And suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange. And the shivers ran up my back. Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this. Having this party. One last fling, you might say. Before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years. Since Barnaby died. We loved each other so... But... That's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition... That something awful, something terrible is going to happen to me. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow... A man who's afraid of his shadow. A girl who's afraid of nothing. And a stranger who strikes in the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From December 5th, 1955, yours truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. 
Uh, one of the shows that uh, Ted has done and uh, made so many old shows that were not very good, uh, much more audible, is uh, Ray is your truly Johnny Dollar. Ted restores these programs to the best fidelity possible given their age and lack of care over the years but ted restores them makes them available to you at a very reasonable price on cassette cd or on flash drive for your computer contact ted radiomemories.com that's radiomemories.com my web page is classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand. You can learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. I've got a list of places where you can download our shows. Uh, we also have our social media links there, Facebook and the Twitter machine and all that. And I also have uh, the ability to contact me and to buy me a coffee. The buy me a coffee money does not buy me coffee. I drink Right now I'm drinking a nice coffee. Uh, uh, a container of coconut water and what but what it does buy is it helps us acquire additional classic radio collections and most especially it helps us keep our distribution channels up and running uh, that is at classicradio.stream thank this station support their advertisers tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial classic radio theater with wyatt cox on your favorite radio station